Hello, people of Earth, and uh, welcome to our uh, SETI Live. So my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. And today we are going to talk about an interesting new step uh, from NASA to find and characterize a, pot a potential a new Earth, an Earth 2.0, Earth sorry. OK, so this is a very interesting uh, new project. And to talk about this project called the Pandora Mission, we invited uh, Elisa Quintana. Hi, Elisa, how are you? Good, thank you for having me. Where are you located, Elisa? I'm currently in Maryland. I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, so the other side of the coast. Yes, so I wanted to mention that Elisa is an astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Center. Uh, and she's also the principal investigator of uh, the Pandora mission. Um, she's uh, well known with, from us because she worked uh, in the past on the Kepler mission at NASA Ames. And she was also a SETI Institute employee. And then she decided to move to the East Coast because she loves uh, snow and the cold weather, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome back. We're very happy to have you here. Um, so if you are watching us, uh, please tell us where you're watching us from. Uh, we are going to have a conversation as usual with Elisa to talk about the mission and uh, what's the goal of this mission. And uh, if you have some questions and you want us to address some specific point, we are listening to you. We are watching you and uh, reading those chat. In fact, I am not doing it. Uh, Beth is watching it uh, in the back with Rebecca and Jasmine. So thank you very much, everybody, for taking care of that. So what, uh, what is Pandora? This is an interesting name, first of all. Maybe we're going to talk about that. But tell <laughs> us about this mission exactly. Sure. Uh, so Pandora is a small set. Um, this is a small platform mission. Um, it is designed to look at uh, exoplanets, which are planets that orbit distant stars, and probe their atmospheres, um, see if we can look at the makeup of their atmospheres. Um, we, are also, uh, we are also designing the mission to, um, just as importantly, look at the exoplanet host stars. So the stars themselves, because we know that small stars can be really active, and we're trying to see how much this activity um, influences our observations and how robust our measurements can be. And so it's a nice, uh, you know, these small sets are nice platforms to complement these uh, upcoming big missions like the James Webb Space Telescope to really maximize the science from those. Yeah, so maybe we should mention that NASA has divided those missions in different categories. There is the discovery mission, there is the flagship mission, and this is a kind of a new program called the Pioneers program. So we yeah. say small sat. We're talking about what? Something big like that or the size of a house? What is what is a small sat? Yeah, so a small sat is sort of in between a cube sat and you know, as you said, NASA has a bunch of different kind of levels. Um, they are given different funding caps. Um, and so if you think of uh, CubeSats have been around a really long time, you know, those are great platforms for universities and their students to work on those. And those come in volumes, which they call kind of cubic units. And so you can have like a, a, a CubeSat this small, or you can have it the size of a, a cereal box. Um, and there weren't a whole bunch of uh, opportunities to design uh, missions um, that were larger than that, but smaller than um, explore class missions, such as the, the test mission, or even something larger like, you know, Kepler or or even Hubble. <laughs> so, uh, so NASA is um, really interested in seeing what kind of astrophysics we can do um, with something, uh, you know, in the small set regime. So, the Pioneers is is a program that's a twenty million dollar um, cost um, total for these missions, and so. Um, what we have, it's not so set as in terms of volume like the CubeSats, but it's still you know, relatively small. Um, and then we design this mission and, we, and then we end up on a ride share for a larger mission. So we put everything together and then we kind of wait and we'll tag, tag along to go on you know, into orbit with, when something bigger goes up. Um, so it is a new class um, for astrophysics for sure. We have lots and lots of you know, all kinds of sizes for Earth science and planetary science, but for astrophysics, you know, we're we're trying to 
really understand what can we do with this kind of size and scope. So this is a low cost mission in 20 millions compared to all the other mission, like a discovery is 450 million, if I remember, for instance, uh, in planetary science. So um, it's 20 million is to cover what? The launch, the operation, the, the data processing, what is, in, in, what is the mission itself? It's not only the satellite, right? It's everything else. It's everything except for launch. So NASA covers the launch, but it's um, everything from engineering to design the mission, to build it, um, to, you know, it's, a, it's also a five-year program. So unlike bigger missions, which can take, you know, decades, mm -hmm. um, it's a five-year mission from, you know, the time we start and the time we um, launch the mission, fly the mission, get the data, write papers, everything. <laughs> so, so that one nice thing is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a challenging timeline for sure, but it is nice to have to know that you can do something within five years. Yeah, it's kind of the startup of, uh, of, uh, of mission, you uh, do everything very quickly and launch it, mm -hmm. operate it, observe it. So what's your role in this program? I say principal investigator, but most, for most people, we don't really know what it means. So are you building yourself the satellites in the lab or what's the role? And um, maybe tell us a bit who is building the, the satellite as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so principal investigator is basically the person that leads the mission. Um, you know, we, I'm not in the lab myself, <laughs> you know, I'm coordinating, um, everything and so every mission has a has a principal investigator um, except for the big flagships I guess it's structured a little bit differently um, but we have partnered with Livermore um, Lawrence Livermore National Lab which is in your neck of the woods um, they have a fantastic group that is doing everything from the optics to um, procure you know buying everything we need the engineering um, they're also managing the program and so it's a little bit of a, um, a unique kind of experiment for us at Goddard because typically NASA Goddard manages and builds a lot of stuff and then the principal investigator, you know, can sometimes be at a university or external. And so at this time we're trying, we're doing a switch to see how this works. Um, and, you know, with these classes, it's, you know, when you try to launch something on a lower budget, um, you, it is, they are higher risk. So all of these, you know, smaller missions are high risk, high reward. That's something NASA's trying to do more of to see what kind of, you know, um, science we can get, and, you know, with without spending so much money on, so much testing and so much oversight. It's just build and see what happens. Um, really but we have a great team at Livermore. And launch it and operate it and hopefully get some good data. So well, that's a good yeah. transition, in fact. But before we're talking about the transition, let me tell you mm -hmm. that we have people watching us from Canada, Germany, Ireland, Denmark, nice. uh, Decatur, Indiana, Netherlands, San Francisco, myself and other people apparently, Sebrin uh, in Florida, North Elman in England, Sintra in Portugal, Selling Grove in Pennsylvania, Colombia, Montreal, Ecuador, uh, Philippines, Laos, Pakistan, and Toronto, Canada. So you're welcome. Oh. We are talking about the Pandora mission, a small sat, a small satellite that could detect uh, and characterize the atmosphere of exoplanets. And that's my mm -hmm. transition. So what is the scientific purpose of uh, Pandora? And what kind of information you're expecting to get from this mission? Sure. Um, so, uh, so NASA has a roadmap um, and, you know, driven by some of these big science questions, uh, how common are other Earth-like planets? Are there life on other planets? You know, these questions driven by the SETI Institute as well. And so, um, you know, we had the Kepler mission, which, uh, which launched in 2009 and found that planets are common with thousands of thousands of planet, planets known. Um, currently the TESS mission is operating and finding planets that are closer to us that we can study in further detail. Um, and then the next step is James Webb, which is, um, has a, a scheduled launch for October. Um, James Webb is going to have capabilities to really look at exoplanet atmospheres to, to unprecedented detail. So we can really learn a lot of, of information on um, many planets, you know, are they, do they have atmospheres like Earth? Are they more puffy like Neptune? And um, 
and you know kind of rewrite the textbooks for that. And so while we are building these missions and we're gaining new technology to probe further and further, um, and our and our measurements require so much precision. Um, now we kind of um, have to take into account a lot of factors that we typically could, you know, just kind of ignore. And so one of them is stellar activity. So uh, we know that stars are active. We see that on the on the sun. You see lots of flares and star spots. Um, and I I wanted to show this um, quick graphic. Put it on play. Um, I'll just leave this up for a moment. Um, so. One of the uh, ways that James Webb um, is going to characterize atmospheres is by looking at exoplanets when they transit their star. And so essentially when a planet's crossing in front of a star, um, starlight filters through the planet's atmosphere. And depending on what, at what um, atoms and molecules are in those atmospheres and you know what um, wavelengths of light they absorb, uh, we can learn a lot about what they're composed of. And and so this whole technique only works if you assume that the light coming from the stars is uniform and constant, because you're basically looking at the planet before transit and during transit um, and, and subtracting at the star to get the planet's atmosphere. Um, but now that we're looking at really, really fine detail, we do have to take into consideration um, stellar activity and that's why we built Pandora. And, and I just wanted to show this movie, which, and it's my last slide, um, just to kind of illustrate. So this is from uh, the solar mission SDO that shows Mercury transit. You can kind of see it somewhere along there. But this really shows even for the sun, which is a quiet star, that there's still so much activity. And so if you think about, we're trying to measure, you know, this tiny atmosphere around this planet, um, but there's so much variations in light coming through um, that um, essentially can contaminate the atmosphere of the planet. Um, this is a, a sort of a new problem that uh, a lot of people have been focusing on lately because, you know, when we observe planets with James Webb and say we discover water in the atmosphere of a new planet, we wanna make sure it's water in, in the atmosphere of that exoplanet and it's not uh, variations from the star that's contaminating it. So um, that's what Pandora is doing. Um, the previous slide uh, showed you know, it's using the same technique that James Webb is going to be doing, but uh, whereas, and the same technique that Hubble has used to probe the atmospheres of giant, giant sized planets. Um, but instead, uh, you know, Hubble and James Webb have these precious telescope time. And so they typically will just observe one transit and you deduce, you know, information from that. Um, what Pandora is going to do is observe these transiting exoplanets for, for a really long time. So for 24 hours to see 10 transits for each exoplanet. And then by doing that, you can get a lot, you can capture all of the information of what's going on with the star and see how much of an effect the stellar, you know, what we call contam contamination mm -hmm. is in these measurements and, and mitigate it. So we can have, um, be really confident that we're finding these, these fantastic uh, um, features in, in exoplanet atmospheres. So in short, the problem we have here is that you, instead of discovering planets like Tess and Kepler has been doing, you want to characterize the atmosphere. To characterize the atmosphere, you really truly need to know what the star, which is in the background, is uh, act, uh, the type of activity the, the star has. So you will do multiple measurements of the, transit ex of the transiting exoplanets. So you either average or better understand the variability of the star, so you can see the, th the thin, the fine um, absorption bands relative to the presence of gas in the atmosphere and not due to the activity in the background from the star. Is that a that's good correct. summary? Perfect, yes. Okay, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's very interesting. And we have done that, as you say, with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, mm -hmm. for some candidates. Um, we will probably do that with the JWST when it's gonna be in uh, flying. Um, what about those planets? Um, I mean, Pandora, you mentioned Pandora is a small satellite. You did mention mm -hmm. the size of the of the aperture, by the way, which is normally what people say. What is it? It is a 0.45 meter telescope. And okay. so, so the way that um, what is unique about Pandora is that we have two, two detectors. So 
um, that will operate simultaneously. So one will be capturing visible light so we can see variations of, um, of the star. Mm -hmm. And the reason you see variations is because uh, you're, be you're basically measuring brightness over time. You know, that's how we detect transits. Um, but if you have star spots rotating in and out of view, um, some spots can be dark, some spots can be bright. And so you can track those uh, star spots coming, you know, from the rotation of the star. Um, and then simultaneously, we'll be taking uh, spectra of, of the exoplanet. So um, by operating both of these simultaneously, we can disentangle the star and planet signals. And so that's really what's, what's unique about Pandora is, is being able to observe these for a really long time because you'll, you would never get that much telescope. You won't get 120 hours of telescope time on Hubble or Webb you know, for, for a single exoplanet. Um, and, and the uh, multi, broad multi-wavelength observations. And, you know, for $20 million, um, it's, it's essentially a calibration mission. You know, we are trying to understand this, this effect and we will be able to, um, you know, once we can disentangle these star and planet signals and remove the stellar effects, uh, we'll be sensitive to water, in the atmosphere, we can see if it's a hydrogen dominated atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, Pandora's goal isn't to do these ultra high precision measurements of the exoplanets. Like that's what James Webb will do. Like we're not, we won't compete with $8 billion <laughs> in, in the James Webb Space Telescope, but we will uh, be able to um, provide this calibration to get the best results from James Webb. So, so these um, small sats and even cube sats and balloons and all of these smaller missions are a great opportunity to do things to complement these flagship missions. Flagship mission. Yeah, the people need to understand that those flagship missions are being shared by thousands of ast uh, astronomers. Okay. And uh, most of them are extragalactic people. They observe galaxies that have achieved very high, so super far, super faint. So they observe mm -hmm. for hours and hours. So people like us, exoplanetary scientists or planetary scientists, even we don't have a lot of time. We just share like a few per percent of the telescope of the JWST time. And uh, what you don't want is to waste a lot of time doing calibration instead of doing real scientific yeah. uh, analysis. So this mission will basically calibrate somehow the activity of the star versus the activity, the, the presence of, of molecules, interesting molecules in the planet. So okay. which planet are we talking about here? Did you select them already or are you waiting for tests to do the, to define them? So we, so there are, you know, hundreds of planets already that, you know, would be great targets. Um, so we, so it's a one year mission. Um, we'll be doing data collection for a year. Uh, we can do an extended mission if we're successful and, and NASA gives us you know, <laughs> more money. Um, but it's a one-year mission. And during that time, uh, because we want to observe for a long time, we have an, a notional baseline of observing 20 um, stars with planets. And right now we made a notional target list. It includes planets as small as Trappist, so Earth-sized planets. And then it has puffy Neptune-sized planets. Um, and the stars they orbit range from you know, these small M dwarfs up to K dwarfs. Um, so, uh, so currently we're, we're showing like, oh, we have these 20 planets. These are some good ones. A lot of them are already targets for James Webb. James Webb will be observing them. Uh, Pandora will be operating simultaneously with James Webb. So we could, oh. in, you know, we could um, monitor stars and planets at the same time. Um, or we can go back and revisit some of the ones that James Webb has looked at. Um, but these are all um, changeable. You know, we'll, we will learn a little bit. James, James Webb is gonna launch this year. So by the time Pandora launches, we'll have some information. You know, they'll probably have uh, observations of Trappist, everyone's favorite Earth-sized planets and see if they look good. Cause you can instantly see if there's some signs of stellar contamination. And so there's, yeah, we can swap in planets up, you know, whenever. Good. We already have some questions. And in fact, it's a question I wanted to ask you. What is the the launch date for Pandora? When what do you what do you target? Uh it's currently November 2024. Okay. And yeah, so it has to be within the five years. <laughs> so that's you that's what we're aiming for. You have a vehicle or you don't know yet? It could be anything. 
Uh, not right now. Not right now. Yeah, we have to still okay. wait. Mm -hmm. So November 2024. Oh my God, you're gonna be like stressed out in October. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I did attend the launches for Kepler and for TESS, and I do remember watching the the PIs for those missions. You know, they well actually Bill Brookie, who was a PI for Kepler, was just cool. He's like it'll work or it won't, you know, he's like, I'm pretty sure it'll work. And he was like, just fine. <laughs> and then the PI of test was a little bit kind of nervous, but you know, they all went up successfully and yeah. they were happy. So, you know, so, you know, as I mentioned, small sets are riskier, but we'll cross our fingers. And hope for the best. Because yeah. <laughs> if you don't take risk, you don't have rewards, right? That's the point of right. those small missions. Um, so you were at the launch pad. I'm, I didn't know that. You, you, were, you have seen a lot of launch of the key mission for the exploration of exoplanets. I'm impressed. Yeah. Lucky. Yeah, I was, I was lucky to be at NASA Ames when Kepler was being designed. Um, that's, that's still one of my favorite missions. You know, it's just so everything that came out of it was just a surprise and it was a really fun mission to work on. Yeah. Are you going to go to the JWST launch? I think it's in French Guiana or something. So yeah. I don't think people, too many people are going, but I'll be watching very nervously, as a lot of people will. I will try to go there if I could. Ooh, <laughs> that'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be nice. Right. Uh, we have also some questions here about the, spectrosco the spectroscopic capabilities. You mentioned that. What is the range of uh, the spectroscopic range of Pandora and maybe the resolution? What do you expect to see in this area? Yeah, so um, we are still we're in a phase right now where we're still trying to nail down um our everything really <laughs> our instrument um we we do plan to use one of the spare flight detectors from james webb um so after james webb launches um then you know they have some flight de flight uh these are these h2rg um uh, detectors for for the spectroscopy um we have a wavelength coverage that's comparable um, to Hubble's Wide Field Camera 3. Um, and so so something like, you know, it, it'll capture the water band, something like um, one, to, to, uh, one to two micron, um, something like that. Um, uh, and, the, and the idea is really to, to um, correct for the, the stellar contamination. And then as a proof of concept, you know, look to see that we can uh, um, observe water features. And, and we have some standard uh, exoplanets where we know we see these features in Hubble, so we can double check that this works. Um, and so it's kind of the two first order look at the atmospheres. Are they dominated by hydrogen? Are they, um, do they have water features? Um, in their atmosphere? Are they covered in clouds? And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the um, observations we've gotten for small planets uh, have resulted in, in, in the, um, you know, uh, a lot of results have said that, well, it looks like we have clouds because it's kind of a flat spectra. But um, what a lot of studies have shown recently is that stellar contamination, not only can it like mimic signatures in a planet spectra, can also suppress it. So there could be um, some exoplanets where they really do have some nice feet, like a lot of these ones that we, we think are just cloudy, could actually have some nice atmospheric features that are just being suppressed. And so, um, so our goal is really to see what is the impact of this contamination and uh, Get a get a nice robust look at at even those planets uh, detected by Hubble or characterized by Hubble. All right, uh, we have people joining us from other places. Niche in Serbia and uh, Fortaleza in Brazil. So welcome. We are talking about the Pandora uh, small sat and this uh, goal to characterize the atmosphere of exoplanets, planets in orbit around other stars. And I would like to mention to you watching us at the moment that City Institute is a nonprofit organization. So we appreciate your donation and we particularly appreciate the donation from Sabine who sent us, uh, make a donation, made a donation on the Facebook. So thank you very much, Sabine. And if you are French, merci beaucoup. <laughs> Okay, so what else? So, oh, there is some questions about the satellite. 
small satellites, uh, everybody freaked out when you hear about small satellites, especially when they in orbit around Earth, which apparently is gonna be the case for Pandora, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What about the stability of the orbit, the pointing? Uh, are you going, uh, have you done some research already with the Livermore to make sure that you can point to the right star and it's gonna stay stable for sufficient amount of time? Do we have this technology to do this? Do we have the technology to compensate for those variations of temperature when you orbit around the, around the planet? So those are qu technical questions, engineering questions, but it's an, inter an interesting question. So go ahead. Yeah, sure. So uh, Pandora is going to be in a low Earth orbit, um, but instead of going around, um, you know, the, the equator, it's going to be in a sun sink orbit. Um, so what it is, is kind of going around, um, it's a, a, let's see, sun sink, low Earth orbit, um, which will enable long stares at a, a really um, large portion of the sky. So we can observe exoplanets for a really long time. Um, this is a nice orbit that, uh, you know, keeps us relatively thermally stable. Um, we do need to have really good pointing. And so this is a common, you know, challenge for these smaller missions. Um, there was another CubeSat called Asteria um, recently out of, out of GPL. And that was a, a small CubeSat. And they were able to show that you can, um, using different techniques, you can get really good pointing, um, sub -arc, arc second pointing on, on some targets. And so we are kind of um, taking that knowledge and trying to work, you know, work it with Pandora so we can get the pointing that we want, the thermal um, requirements that we want. And it looks like uh, we have a closed design right now. Um, but yeah, the, those are all challenging, especially for these small small missions that don't have a lot of, of mass. <laughs> Good. Uh, some of the questions related to the data. So Pandora is going to take a lot of data. You mentioned like 100 hours of observation stars and then star plus the transit of the exoplanet. Uh, will this data be released and available to the public? Do you have a citizen scientist project linked to this Pandora mission? Yeah, so our so we have some um, people working on a data pipeline at NASA Ames. Um, so these are uh, a group of people that worked on the K2, Kepler and K2 missions. And um, so they uh, are writing a, a processing pipeline so that we can uh, in so that we can um, provide not just raw data, but some light curves and some time um, bearing spectroscopy and everything. And, and we are releasing it as soon as possible. We want um, you know, everyone to be able to take advantage of, of what we collect. Um, we, we don't have, so these small sub programs don't typically have guest observer programs or participating scientist programs, um, but we, our project scientist is Nicole Cologne. Um, she's also working on the James Webb Space Telescope. So she is going to put together a program uh, to see how we can engage the community. Um, we also are really excited about the opportunities for ground-based um, and other facilities to do simultaneous observations with Pandora. So there's a lot of opportunities for, uh, for community involvement. And so that we should be fleshing out um, sometime next year. All right. Do you have a website where you describe all of this? Is it uh, very... I, I have one in prep. <laughs> I will do, yeah, um, soon. Yeah. Yeah. We will post it and it's going to be ready in the description. Okay, that'd be fantastic. All right, so one question that uh, I mentioned to you briefly before we start. What, what's, his, what's his name? Why, why Pandora? Because you opened <laughs> Pandora box? Why did, why did we choose this name and who chose it? Um, so it was when, so Pandora did start out as, as a CubeSat um, and it ended up getting bigger because we realized we can fit everything in a smaller in a small CubeSat. Um, so I think talking with Tom Tom Barclay, he's a he's an astronomer also working on TESS. He's instrument scientist for Pandora. Um, we were trying we had to think of a name because we had to submit I don't know some paperwork, and then we were like, what's it? We were thinking CubeSat, and we're like, what's a box? And we we're just like Pandora's box, and then it was like a minute conversation, and we're like, well, you know, it does have like Earth and fire, you know, like. Um, planets and stars. And so we, we just stuck with that. And 
that's about as much thought that we put into it. Um, we didn't want to do acronyms <laughs> because we're trying to avoid acronyms. And yeah. so it just kind of stuck. So good. nothing too deep. <laughs> it's good to find a name like this. Generally, names are found by having a conversation in the hallway with a friend or a scientist yeah. <laughs> or, or having two or, two or three drinks in a bar. That's the best time, the best time to find names for a mission. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm very, I, I, I applaud the fact that you did not want an acronym. Because I'm also like people, my generation, we are the same generation. We are so tired of those acronyms. So it's great. And we're glad to, to have real names for missions at a mistake. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we're going to wrap up. But before we're wrapping up, so what's the next step for you? Are you the PI of this? Do you work on some, something else? Or you dedicated full time on that? What's the typical life of Elisa Quintana in, uh, in uh, Maryland now? Oh, yeah, so I've been at NASA Goddard for four years now. Um, I'm, I'm currently deputy project scientist for the test mission. I've been working on communications for the Roman Space Telescope. Um, but since Pandora was selected, I'm almost entirely focusing on that. Um, so, so what happens is um, we're in this initial period. Uh, we have to write up a, a, a report. NASA will give us a green light and then, um, you know, we'll... Um, we'll be busy for five years. Um, so I don't really know what's next. I've always wanted to, you know, I did, I did aerospace um, as a master's in addition to my, my PhD in physics. And just because I've always loved working on small missions. And so this is, you know, a dream come true, being able to work on a mission from idea to hopefully launch. Um, I also run an exoplanet group at Goddard and I, I've really been enjoying doing project management, working with people. And so my options are continue to work on, on missions or you know work on uh, managing groups and projects is, is one thing I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, right. So it's not clear, but, but yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> we will see. You have a lot of options apparently. So I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that. Mm -hmm. right. Well, but thank you very much, Elisa, for coming to speak to us virtually about the Pandora mission. Um, I just would like to say to our viewers that uh, I remind you that we are a nonprofit organization, the SETI Institute. Uh, you can support us by making a donation. You are inclined. Go to our website, SETI.org, and click on uh, donation, donate. You can become a city star and you can basically uh, every month make a small donation and that's we pay my coffee and uh, and the electricity bill for this uh, for the this enormous facility you see me inside at the moment <laughs> um, also you can join us on social media click on uh, join us on this uh, youtube uh, youtube uh, page so you know when we have the next city live the next city talk or any other city bites, we call those small videos talking about specific scientific topic. Uh, yeah, join us, join the conversation. Uh, space is big. We need people like you. We need everybody. We need Elisa. We need it, but everybody else. Okay. So thank you very much again, Elisa, and uh, see you, you soon. Bye bye. Yeah.